intraventricular hemorrhage. My name is Anne Hansen, and I'm going to talk to you today about the most common neurologic complication of prematurity, namely germinal matrix and intraventricular hemorrhage. I'm going to use the abbreviation GMH-IVH. This information will be helpful in both minimizing risk factors for GMH-IVH and providing accurate information for parents who usually prioritize knowledge about potential neurologic concerns. During this lesson, we are going to discuss the incidence, pathogenesis, and risk factors, presentation and diagnosis, management, neuropathic consequences, and outcome of patients who develop an intraventricular hemorrhage. Incidence of germinomatrix intraventricular hemorrhage. First, let's talk about incidence. Germinal matrix and intraventricular hemorrhage is the most common neurologic complication of prematurity. It occurs in somewhere between 15 and 20% of preterm infants. If you spend time working in a neonatal intensive care unit, it won't be long before you take care of a baby with a germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhage. Before we talk further about GMH, IVH, try to imagine what the brain of a profoundly preterm infant actually looks like. This is a photo of the brain of a 24-week gestation infant who died of complications of prematurity. It's helpful to keep this image in mind as you learn about GMH IVH. While the external appearance of a premature infant is obviously immature, the brain, though not visible, is equally underdeveloped. The germinal matrix is a neuronal and glial cell precursor site that's located in the subependymal region in the caudothalamic groove. Bleeding within the germinal matrix is called a germinal matrix or subependymal hemorrhage. The blood in the germinal matrix can extend into the lateral ventricles, causing an intraventricular hemorrhage. The germinal matrix is a fetal structure that spontaneously involutes starting at about 24 weeks gestation. It's pretty much gone by about 34 weeks gestation. Term babies don't have a germinal matrix. That's why germinal matrix and intraventricular hemorrhage are almost exclusively a complication of preterm infants. Pathogenesis and risk factors for GMH, IVH. Germinal matrix and intraventricular hemorrhages are caused by bleeding that typically originates in the extremely vascular, fragile, and friable germinal matrix. Abnormal coagulation or cerebral blood flow can contribute to GMH, IVH. Many preterm infants are particularly vulnerable to alterations in cerebral blood flow because they have a pressure-passive circulation, meaning that they cannot regulate their cerebral blood pressure to protect against fluctuations in systemic blood pressure. These are all important considerations in thinking about the risk factors for GMH, IVH. What puts a patient at risk for intraventricular hemorrhage? The following story describes a mock patient named Sarah and serves to illustrate the risk factors for IVH and how they commonly arise during a preterm infant's hospital course. Sarah was born at 25 weeks gestation at a community hospital because her mother presented in preterm labor with a fever, foul-smelling amniotic fluid, and uterine tenderness concerning for chorioamnionitis. There was no neonatologist at her delivery and it was quite a challenge for the pediatric staff to stabilize her until the transport team arrived to pick her up. The transport team intubated her and gave her a dose of surfactant based on a chest x-ray that was consistent with respiratory distress syndrome. They put her in the ambulance and on her way back to the tertiary care hospital, she developed a tension pneumothorax. The pneumothorax reduced her cardiac output and she developed hypotension. Once she arrived in the neonatal intensive care unit at the tertiary referral center, the admitting team evacuated the pneumothorax and corrected her blood pressure. The following morning, they obtained a head ultrasound. What would you be concerned that this head ultrasound might show? It showed an intraventricular hemorrhage. In a moment, we'll discuss how to describe or grade her intraventricular hemorrhage. But first, let's go back to the risk factors to be sure that we understand each of the items on the list. To complete this list, we need to add asphyxia, patent ductus arteriosus, and coagulopathy. The risk factors are closely linked to the pathogenesis of intraventricular hemorrhage. 
Besides the coagulopathy, which speaks for itself as a risk factor for intracranial hemorrhage, what do you think that all of the things on this list have in common? Each of the items on this list causes either an increase or a fluctuation in cerebral blood flow. It's important to remember that many of the ways in which we provide care for newborn premature infants can cause either an increase or a fluctuation in cerebral blood flow. We increase cerebral blood flow when we provide a volume expander. Therefore, it is extremely important to avoid the infusion of colloid or hyperosmolar fluids when possible, and when they must be given, to infuse them slowly. Cerebral blood flow also increases when we let a patient be hypercarbic, anemic, or hypoglycemic, or when we perform procedures that cause the patient to have a Valsalva response, which can increase cerebral blood flow. We see fluctuation in cerebral blood flow in the setting of a pneumothorax, for example, if it is evacuated and then recurs, or during seizures, or if we perform an exchange transfusion on a premature infant. Keeping all of this in mind, trying to normalize and stabilize cerebral blood flow, especially in the first few days after the birth of a preterm infant, can help to minimize the risk of GMH IVH. Presentation and diagnosis of IVH. The presentation of intraventricular hemorrhage is most commonly silent. You may feel a full fontanelle, and the patient may demonstrate anemia on blood testing, but the most common presentation is silent. In the literature, you may read about a saltatory or catastrophic presentation, but these are quite rare. The saltatory presentation describes a change in consciousness, hypotonia, and abnormal eye movements. The catastrophic presentation involves rapid neurologic deterioration, stupor, tonic posturing, and profound hypotension. Since the presentation of intraventricular hemorrhage is largely silent, we rely on screening head ultrasounds to make the diagnosis. We obtain coronal and sagittal views. Cranial ultrasound is an ideal technique because it is high resolution, portable, and does not cause any radiation exposure. We usually order head ultrasounds according to a schedule based on the patient's chronologic age. When do you typically order a head ultrasound for a prematurely born baby? Please leave us your answer in the comments section of this video. Of course, there's some variation from institution to institution, but a fairly typical routine for babies born at less than 32 weeks gestation or less than 1,500 grams is to get a head ultrasound at seven to 10 days after birth with an earlier study about three days after birth for the most high-risk patients. This timing is based on data like this. 50% of intraventricular hemorrhages occur in the first day, and 90% within the first three days, according to a study by Dr. Volpe. Essentially 100% of GMH IVH has occurred by one week after birth, according to a study by Dr. Panath that involved over 1,000 infants weighing less than two kilograms. So if a baby does not have a GMH IVH diagnosed by about one week of age, it's most likely that that will not be a complication of prematurity that this baby will suffer. The Papille Grading System. Now we're going to talk about the Papille Grading System for IVH. This grading system is very problematic, but it's also used extensively, especially in follow-up literature, because it provides a quantitative scaling for neurologic injury. I'm going to go through the four Papille grades of IVH. I will also describe why some of these grades are problematic. First is the grade one, or germinal matrix hemorrhage. You might also hear it called a subependymal hemorrhage. This is not an intraventricular hemorrhage. It's only a hemorrhage in the germinal matrix region. Next is a grade two, intraventricular hemorrhage. This is a perfectly fine term. It refers to an intraventricular hemorrhage without enough blood to cause any ventricular dilation. Next, we have a grade three hemorrhage. This is intended to refer to an IVH that has enough blood introduced into the ventricle to cause the ventricle itself to dilate. It often is confused with a grade two IVH in which there is CSF buildup due to post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and ventricular enlargement on that basis.
that should actually be called a grade 2 IVH with secondary posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. The most problematic term is a grade 4 IVH. Like a grade 1 IVH, a grade 4 IVH does not refer to an actual IVH. A grade 4 IVH refers to parenchymal bleeding. We now understand that this parenchymal blood is much more likely to be a venous infarction than an extension of a grade 3 IVH. Let's go over some pathological samples and some head ultrasounds of various grades of IVH. Here you can see on the left a germinal matrix that is normal, and on the right a germinal matrix that has a hemorrhage in it. On the head ultrasound, you can see on the left a germinal matrix that is slightly echogenic, and on the right a germinal matrix that's echogenic with blood that's extended into the ventricle. On this pathologic sample, you can see an intraventricular hemorrhage with ventricular dilation. Because there's not actually very much blood in this ventricle, most likely this ventricular dilation is on the basis of posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. In the head ultrasounds, you can see blood in the ventricles bilaterally with enough blood that the ventricles are dilated. These would be grade 3 intraventricular hemorrhages. And here you can see pictures of parenchymal hemorrhages. In the pathologic sample, you can see on the right that there's parenchymal bleeding and that there's also blood in the ventricles. And on the head ultrasound findings, you can see on the right that there's echogenicity extending into the parenchymal region that would also be read as a grade 4 or a parenchymal hemorrhage. We used to think that the parenchymal blood extended from the ventricles into the tissue of the brain. But what we now understand is that these are periventricular hemorrhagic infarctions that are probably of venous origin due to obstruction of blood flow in the terminal vein. In this picture, you can see that as the ventricle fills with blood, the parenchyma of the brain can become compressed and obstruct the venous drainage on the side of the IVH. If you think back to the gelatinous picture of the brain at 24 weeks gestation, it would be easy to imagine how the non-muscularized venous system would easily be obstructed and how that could cause a secondary venous infarction. This is what we now understand is the basis of what we've been calling grade 4 or parenchymal hemorrhages. Management of IVH. The management of intraventricular hemorrhage is largely supportive. We try to maintain stable cerebral perfusion, normal blood pressure, normal electrolytes, and normal serum glucose levels. We also treat anemia, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy. Neuropathic consequences and outcome. What are the neuropathologic consequences of developing a germinal matrix or intraventricular hemorrhage? A germinal matrix hemorrhage can cause destruction of glial cell precursors and this area is replaced with a hematoma, or cyst, as can be seen on these head ultrasounds. The other neurologic consequences of an intraventricular hemorrhage is posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. This occurs when there's impairment of cerebrospinal fluid absorption by the arachnoid villi, or mechanical obstruction, of CSF flow. Posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus occurs in approximately one-third of all patients with intraventricular hemorrhages. Of that one-third, two-thirds of the infants actually have spontaneous arrest or resolution of the hydrocephalus within a month of onset. Please note that of that two-thirds who recover spontaneously, about 5% will develop progressive hydrocephalus again up to one year later. But of that one-third of patients with IVH, who develop posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus, one third of them will go on to develop long term problems with posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. How do we diagnose and monitor posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus? The most basic approach to monitoring is to take a plain tape measure and measure head circumference on a daily basis. It can be difficult to determine what is an appropriate head circumference growth for a preterm infant. Typically, we say that one centimeter a week is normal. However, if a patient is having poor overall somatic growth and not gaining well in weight or length, one centimeter a week may be excessive. On the other hand, if the patient is gaining weight very well and having good catch-up growth, 
more than one centimeter a week may be appropriate. So it's a good idea to put together the head circumference measurements with weight and length measurements to get an overall assessment of what would be expected. In general, growth of more than two centimeters a week is excessive. In addition to our head circumference measurements, we also look at vital signs and clinical status, things such as lethargy, feeding intolerance, and apnea bradycardia events. And finally, our gold standard is serial head ultrasounds, which we typically obtain at least weekly. The resistive index can be a useful, non-invasive measurement obtained during a head ultrasound that can guide the management of post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. It is defined as systolic blood flow velocity minus diastolic blood flow velocity over systolic blood flow velocity, as measured by Doppler ultrasound, typically of the anterior cerebral artery. If there is not a non-neurologic etiology of elevated RI, as seen with large PDA or high-frequency ventilation, then either an elevated RI or a significant change in RI with gentle compression of the fontanelle by the ultrasound probe raises concern that the patient's degree of intracranial pressure elevation is a risk of ischemic brain injury and should have CSF removed. Our therapy for post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is aimed at reducing intracranial pressure by removal of CSF. Generally, we start with serial lumbar punctures. This is an effort to remove CSF in bulk. It is a temporizing measure to safely buy time while determining if a patient with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is going to be in the two-thirds that gets better group or the one-third that needs long-term therapy. If a patient is determined to be in the one-third that needs long-term therapy group, they need more definitive treatment. One bridging therapy can be a subgaleal shunt. This is a shunt that starts in the ventricular space and allows fluid to flow up into the subgaleal space. When assessing whether a subgaleal shunt is functioning or not, it's not important to palpate the area where the subgaleal shunt is present underneath the skin. Instead, you want to do what you always do to assess for elevated intracranial pressure. Feel the fontanelle, follow the head circumference, and look at the patient's clinical status. The definitive treatment for post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is typically a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. Patients are generally big enough for a VP shunt when they reach 1.5 to 2 kilograms. This is a picture of a patient with a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. It starts in the ventricle. It tracks out to just underneath the skin. You can generally feel it in the neck. And then there's redundant length of the shunt in the abdomen so that the baby can grow up to be six feet tall and have the shunt still end in the peritoneal space. Ventriculoperitoneal shunts come with their own set of complications, including a risk of both infection and obstruction. Parents who have a baby with a ventriculoperitoneal shunt need to be sure to have the shunt assessed for those potential complications, especially in the setting of fever or neurologic signs and symptoms. Some centers now perform a procedure called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy with choroid plexus cauterization. This is an alternative to a VP shunt and avoids the complications of shunt infections and obstructions. The best candidates for an ETV CPC are patients in whom the aqueduct is obstructed and who do not have scarring of the prepontine cistern. Prevention. Unfortunately, we don't have very many ways of preventing intraventricular hemorrhage. If we could prevent premature birth, we would prevent intraventricular hemorrhage because this is primarily a complication of preterm babies. We've looked at many different potential antenatal pharmacotherapies to decrease IVH rates, and the one agent that is clearly effective is maternal receipt of a complete course of antenatal steroids. In utero transport certainly helps, as well as optimal management of labor and delivery. Researchers have also looked at the potential for postnatal pharmacotherapy to decrease risk of IVH in preterm infants. The only agent that is effective in decreasing the IVH risk is indomethacin. Based on the most recent Cochrane meta-analysis updated in 2010, the use of prophylactic indomethacin reduces symptomatic PDA and severe IVH, but does not 
either benefit or harm longer-term outcomes, including neurodevelopment. Additionally, indomethacin is accompanied by its own set of risks, including that of intestinal perforation, especially when given in close proximity to systemic steroids. Therefore, the use of prophylactic indomethacin remains controversial and must be individualized based on clinical circumstances, local IVH rates, and personal preference. Some centers use publicly available IVH calculators to tailor the decision for specific patients. Now I'll talk about outcome of patients with IVH. This is where the Papil grading system, despite all of its problems, is useful because it allows us to categorize the hemorrhages into more severe and less severe. Outcomes. Patients with grade one and two IVH overall have only a minimal increased risk of adverse neurologic outcome compared to very low birth weight infants with no intraventricular hemorrhage. As developmental testing becomes more refined, there are reports of an increased risk of cognitive impairment and cerebral palsy, but it is difficult to sort out the effects of the IVH and that of white matter injury, which often coexists in this patient population and can be missed by head ultrasound. In general, we can assure parents that if their baby develops either a germinal matrix or intraventricular hemorrhage without ventricular dilation, we would expect them to have approximately the same outcome as babies matched by birth weight, gestational age, and severity of illness with negative head ultrasounds. By contrast, patients with IVH resulting in ventricular dilation and those with periventricular hemorrhagic infarction have a markedly increased risk of impaired neurodevelopment. About one-third of patients with a grade 3 IVH, that is to say an IVH with ventricular dilation on the basis of the amount of blood that's in the ventricle, will have a major handicap. And about three-fourths of babies with parenchymal hemorrhages will have a major handicap. These patients are also at risk for visual impairment and seizures. If they have associated white matter injury, they may develop spastic diaparesis as well as cognitive delays. If the injury is extensive and bilateral, especially if also associated with periventricular leukomalacia, it can result in quadriparesis and severe cognitive deficits. The patients with posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus are the ones with the most severely affected outcomes. About 90% of them will have neurodevelopmental impairments. 56% of them will have multiple impairments. 14% will have seizures that require medical therapy, 9% will have severe vision problems, and 6% will have sensory neural hearing loss. The characteristics associated with the poorest prognosis are bilateral involvement, persistent ventricular enlargement, parenchymal involvement, periventricular echodensity or echolucency, which is PVL, or low gestational age. It's important to note that persistent ventricular enlargement can be on the basis of blood, as in the setting of grade 3 IVH. It can be due to CSF buildup due to post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, or it can be due to an ex vacuo hydrocephalus due to actual volume loss of the parenchyma. The reason that low gestational age is on this list is that profoundly preterm infants often have multiple complications of prematurity, each one making it more difficult to compensate for the other. For example, if a patient has an interventricular hemorrhage that would predispose them to, for example, a learning disability, and the patient also has retinopathy of prematurity and therefore has visual difficulties, the visual difficulties make it more difficult to compensate for the learning difficulties. I hope that this lesson has helped you to understand the assessment and management of intraventricular hemorrhage and posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus, including the importance of rigorous attention to the cerebral perfusion, blood pressure, electrolytes, glucose, hematocrit, platelet, and coagulation factors in the first week after the birth of infants born under 32 weeks gestation. I also hope you now feel more confident in answering parents' questions about what to expect with their preterm baby in terms of potential neurologic complications and their prognostic implications. Thank you.